With us today is Katie Milkman. I'm very, very excited about this conversation. She's a professor at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. She's the host of the Charles Schwab's uh, behavioral economics podcast, Choiceology. Uh, she was former president of the International Society for Judgment and Decision Making. It's an interesting one. Uh, and because judgment is so poor in so many places in the world and, and, and in this country, I'm sort of curious to get your perspective on that. Uh, she's a scientist, she's a writer, uh, she graduated my alma mater, so I'm, you know, particularly interested. Uh, Katie, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Katie, I, I, I want to take sort of a walk down uh, memory lane to your path to sort of, you know, how you got to where you are. I'm finding that's more and more interesting uh, to talk about with my guests. So, you know, where were you born? And, and uh, uh, like, you know, I'm going to sort of let you roam free a little bit on, on the path to getting to where you are now. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to share that. Um, so I am from the Washington, D.C. area, and I grew up in the suburbs. And uh, I, I had, I guess, the main thing in my childhood that is, is relevant is, one, I was really lucky to have. Um, amazing parents who were hugely supportive of all my endeavors. So that's a really big deal. Of course, I got to go to a really terrific school that that was really focused on academic achievement. And I was surrounded by other people who are really into their academic achievement. And that was that was huge. And then the final bit about my childhood that might be relevant is that I became a really serious and competitive junior tennis player. And I competed in national tournaments. I spent hours a day out on the court honing my skills and that comes up a lot actually in the book I ended up writing which was a little bit of an accident I didn't realize when I wrote a book about the science of behavior change that tennis would end up being a theme that I returned to but so many of the lessons that I learned on the court about life about uh, success about change sort of came back to me as I was trying to tell stories and figure out how to convey the science I'd learned best. So that that ended up shaping me in more ways than maybe I even appreciated at the time. Um, um, let I, me let me ask you a question. When when you say I'm sort of curious about this line and it it's it could be taken at face value, but I'm curious to unpack it a little bit. My parents were super supportive of everything that I did. And and I'm curious what that looks like. I mean it might seem like a stupid question, but I, but I, it feels important to me. No, it, it was important. I, um, you know, some people have the wind in their face, uh, pushing them down. And I had the wind at my back in that I had, um, two amazing people who really wanted to see me succeed. I was, a um, I'm not an only child. I have a half brother, but he was 18 years older than I was and out of the house. And so I was sort of the center of my parents' lives and they were, they both had careers, but, um, they really prioritized making, my life great and and helping me achieve over it seemed like just about everything else i have a kid of my own now and i look back and i just feel incredibly lucky that i had parents who invested so much time and energy in me driving me <laughs> all over creation so that i could pursue my ambitions so i think that just matters mattered a lot i feel yeah. very lucky um and and uh, and i'm curious about the ambitions part so what i'm curious about is did you have a sense like, were they following your lead on that? Or were there certain things that they really wanted to see you do and they were supportive of you succeeding in those things? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think like all parents, they are, there was a bit of direction in there, <laughs> um, but they also let me pick for sure. It wasn't like they said, you know, you have to go down this path, but they, if they saw me get interested in something, they sort of poured more and more into that and sort of brought me to the next level and helped me find the next thing. Uh, and I don't know if they would have done that if my passions hadn't been aligned with things they thought were worthwhile. Uh, uh -huh. I, you know, I got into school in part because they thought academics were really important and they conveyed that over and over again. So I worked hard in school and right. because they, they poured that value into me and then they supported that when I struggled, if I needed extra right. help, they found ways to get it. Um, and then sports, I think they felt that was a great way to be healthy and also to learn life lessons. And so when I started excelling in tennis at a young age, they invested in that. They, you know, found great coaches. They took the time to bring me to 
tennis lessons and 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 that was your drive like the desire to play tennis competitively was coming from you you know can a 10 year old have that kind of drive i don't know i think i i could see that i was good at this and i liked the friendships i was forming on the court and i liked excelling who doesn't like being good at something i i think that they also were pushing to some degree because they saw this as a path that could open doors that might not open otherwise um right. and so that combination led me down right. down it probably right. i don't you know if i had had other parents i probably wouldn't have been a super competitive right. tennis player <laughs> Um, and, and you went, uh, so, so moving forward, you, you went to college and you studied, you became an engineer or you studied engineering. Yes. So I, play, I played tennis in college too. And right. about halfway through, I actually quit so that I could focus more uh, on being an engineer. Cause I realized that's what I wanted to do. I, di I didn't go to college thinking I had no interest in engineering. I didn't really know what it was, except that it was in the family. And so the language of it was familiar when I started to see it, but I thought I was going to be a bachelor of arts student, like most, I think most undergrads that are alma mater. Um, and I actually had to switch partway through and go to summer school and take all these extra classes to catch up. But I found engineering really compelling. So that, you know, that's why I did the extra work. Right. And then, and, and I, I mean, I remember the equad was like, I don't know if it's still there when you were in school, but yes, it was far away from away. campus. And we always felt sad for people who, you know, like, were, I know. And I uh, opt, I switched into that life, um, <laughs> which was a little crazy, but it's funny. Okay. And, and so then you, you, when you graduated, what then? Uh, well, I had fallen in love with research. So not just engineering, but, um, part of what drew me to engineering is that I love data and I loved analyzing and crunching numbers and figuring things out. And that was really, you know, and that shows, I mean, your book <laughs> that show that, that love and that passion, uh, is, is throughout your book. Uh, I'm glad that it comes through, <laughs> uh, the, the process of writing a thesis, which is actually required at Princeton, showed me that I wanted to be a researcher. I'd done the sort of traditional, if a lot of people at Princeton do internships and I followed that path in industry. So I, you know, tried out things like investment banking and equity research and even did a gig in government at the commerce department. And none of those things captured my imagination the way that doing research captured my imagination. So I decided mm -hmm. to get a PhD. Uh, and because I had this background in engineering, I was thinking my PhD would probably naturally be in a similar field. So I ended up in a PhD program in computer science and business uh, at Harvard, where I thought I could blend my interests in, you know, engineering, programming, crunching numbers, and but also like learning more about this new wacky world of e-commerce, which was seemed like the new thing, right? It's like 2004 it was clear that the internet was going to change everything, but it hadn't quite happened yet. So I thought like, what better to learn about than, um, than this field. And I thought computer science and business, I could blend and learn. And it turns out that's not really what I was interested in. I just sounded cool and shiny and new. <laughs> and when I got to graduate school and started learning more about the research process and different subfields and what was being studied in those fields, I was lucky to stumble upon behavioral economics. I had to take a microeconomic sequence and, and um, Harvard turned out to be a hotbed of this new field. Danny Kahneman had just won his Nobel prize for the work he'd done with Amos Tversky, demonstrating that people are sort of predictably imperfect in, in the judgments that they make and that we can model the ways that they're imperfect. I thought Danny Kahneman was Princeton. No, it was Danny Harvard. Kahneman was Princeton. No, was Princeton. it was just that uh, the the economists in the world who started getting excited about his ideas, most of them sat at Harvard or at Berkeley. Oh, interesting. And so oh, those right. were the places where in, in economics right, departments, right. the seed had really taken off. And right. so um, the micro sequence I took actually introduced behavioral economics, whereas none of the classes I'd taken at Princeton, despite Danny Kahneman being there, had right. covered this material. And I'd never met him as an undergraduate or heard anything about him. It wasn't until years later that, right. anyway, what a missed opportunity, but that's how life is. I, I've had many opportunities that weren't missed, so I mostly just feel <laughs> lucky. Um, so I fell in love with this field as soon as I encountered it. It 
it just encapsulated so much that felt true. In fact, part of the reason I'd become an engineer and been disillusioned by what I'd originally thought I might want to study, which was economics, is that uh, the really simplistic models that said people are constantly optimizing and making perfect decisions that basic economics assumes made no sense to me. It seemed like a waste of time to use those kinds of models given uh, my observations of humanity. And once I realized there was a whole field devoted to figuring out when do people make mistakes and, and that I could even start looking at how can we improve decisions, then I got really excited and hooked. And that, that, that sort of set me on the path for the rest of right. my career, though there were more pivots along the way. So, um, so first of all, I, I think there's like a long line of, of leaders, very, very successful leaders who are engineers, uh, have an engineering mindset and are engineers. And, and I think the person that comes to mind is Alan Mulally, who turned Ford around uh, in, in, during the, the financial crisis in 2008. And, and his process for changing people was create a very clear process um and and then uh have zero toleration for deviation right so it's like he built airplanes he was boeing beforehand so he built airplanes you know if you if you deviate from the process your plane falls out of the sky right if you deviate from your process of a car like you can't really deviate from the process and he approached human behavior in 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 a very very similar way to say we're gonna have certain rules about how we engage and and i'm gonna be pretty strict about it and it worked very, very well. What I, and he was very, very successful in the turnaround. Um, what I wonder is if this kind of approach to change is particularly suited to certain kinds of people, not only in terms of leading change, but in terms of sort of receiving change, um, uh, like, and changing ourselves. Like, are there, and I'm curious about this in your research, like, are there, are, are there different kinds of people who um, who are susceptible to change methodologies and then other, you know, because their mind works a certain way and other people who aren't like, I, I'm, I'm just sort of, you've done, you, the research you do is often in the field. It's not, you know, it's not sitting in a lab. And so I'm sort of curious about, you know, does this work for everybody kind of thing? Or are there certain kinds of minds for which engineering a change is much more effective? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the, the key premise of my book and sort of the key takeaway from my research in the last couple decades um, is that if we want to create change, it's really important to tailor the solutions we offer to the individual as opposed to applying a one-size-fits-all strategy. I don't mm -hmm. think of that so much as having to do with personality types as I do um, think of it having to do with what the specific barriers are for an individual. So there might be lots of different personality types that all struggle with, say, um, forgetfulness, right? That That isn't really a personality trait so much as right. it is something that you might have difficulty with either because you have limited memory or you have a complicated life, um, a lot going on. Um, and then some other people might struggle more because they lack confidence. Again, I don't know that that's a personality trait. It does correlate with certain demographic groups who've been um, facing negative stereotypes their whole lives and that's crushed confidence uh, as it, you know, as you might expect. Uh, some people are struggling because of procrastination. Again, not a personality type, but a, a barrier more for some than others. So right. I do think it's important to tailor the solution to the individual, but um, I, I think that's distinct from saying personality types might respond differently to a, a rigid um, set of rules right. to change. That's interesting. Okay, so so uh, you know, he, a, as I was reading your book, and we're gonna we're gonna walk through each of the problems that you identify and solutions for them. Um, I I found myself. Uh, ironically coming up with one major question, which, you know, is ironic because like I write a lot about change and I help people make changes. And, you know, like I'm constantly like in, in some ways, my entire body of work is about closing the gap between what we know and what we do. Right. Um, and, and the question that kept coming out for me is a little bit of an existential question, which is why is it so important that people change? 
like, do we have an epidemic of sorts of like, you know, dissatisfaction with ourselves and what we're doing? And, you know, are, are we, are, are you and I, you know, in our work, sort of supporting a dysfunction in our society that says, I'm, I'm not okay. And there's a lot of things I need to change. And, and, and I sort of think of like the diet industry, right? And I also sort of think of this sort of movement of intuitive eating, which is like, you know, like actually just relax all of the rules, relax all of these sort of attempts at controlling your own behavior and, you know, be more in touch with what's really going on and you will naturally sort of evolve in the way that you want to. I don't know if I believe in it. I tend to evolve into eating a lot of sugar. Um, but but it's but I but I am really sitting with that question, which is, you know, are we focusing too much on becoming people on, on sort of a dissatisfaction with who we are and becoming people that we're not yet? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You talked about diet, which is, of course, an area where there's a lot of dysfunction. And so in that specific domain, I suspect it is true that we over obsess about our ideals. And obviously, there's lots of people who ha have eating disorders as a result of that, particularly young women. Uh, so so in that domain, maybe, yes, we have dysfunction. I think more generally, though, the fact that people have ambitions and hope to grow and improve is a great thing. Uh, it gives our lives more meaning and purpose. And if anything, what research shows is that we uh, are under investing in trying to change. Uh, and that might sound strange, given that we have a, you know, 9 billion plus per year self help industry. But what academics have shown time and again, is generally we are status quo biased, which means we tend to stick too much with whatever it is we're currently doing, not search enough, not explore enough, not look for enough paths to change. And one of my favorite studies that has been done recently that I think gets at why it might be important to change is, is a really cute experiment that Steve Levitt of Freakonomics fame ran. Um, he was getting all of these requests from people after he became, you know, a worldwide celebrity, having written this mega bestseller. And he's a brilliant economist at the University of Chicago, a John Bates Clark medalist, which is sort of like the young Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, all these people started knocking on his door, asking him for life advice as a result of these credentials. And he, he felt really unqualified to offer it. And they were asking questions from like, you know, should I leave my, my partner? Should I start a new business <laughs> to like, should I dye my hair red or, um, you know, be an econ major? I was going to be a psych major. So like big changes, small changes all across the board. He felt unqualified to answer. And he really, so many of the questions he got came in the form of, should I make this change or not? That maybe he could collect some data that might help because he's an empiricist. So he ran this little experiment with readers of the Freakonomics blog who were thinking about making a life change. He invited them to flip a virtual coin on this website he set up. And if it came up heads, uh, he would encourage them to make the change. And if it came up tails, he encouraged them not to. And they knew they were in an experiment. <laughs> and of course, like lots of people aren't going to comply with what a coin flip says, but these were people who were on the margin enough that they said, you know, I'll, I'll flip the coin. I'll participate in this. So it turns out the coin flip changes the rate at which people change significantly enough that he can measure differences between the people who got a heads and tails and their happiness uh, and see whether on average, having a little more change injected into your life when you're on the margin makes you happier or less happy. So tens of thousands of people go through this process, come back, report back on their happiness. And what he finds is that it didn't really matter for small life changes that people were contemplating, right? The, the hairstyle change, the, um, you know, changing your diet slightly kind of changes. Those didn't change happiness, but the big changes that people were contemplating when that coin um, flipped heads and they were encouraged to make the change, people ended up happier. So I think that's, that's nice evidence that uh, along with the research on status quo bias, escalation of commitment that we generally tend to be too stuck in our ways, that a little more change is good. And even with all the obsession you point out, we're actually perhaps under investing in change. Right. Interesting. Um, okay. I have one, one last question, um, which is, you know, sort of not specifically related to the book, but, um, you know, I also found myself like, you're very, very connected, 
with lots of researchers. You collaborate really well. You've got, you know, this relationship, you know, Angela Duckworth, who wrote your foreword. We talked earlier, uh, you know, off, off screen, we emailed about Don Moore, you know, both of whom have been on the website, who you're close with. And it occurred to me that like academia has this really interesting balance of like deep collaboration, right? Every research paper has more than one author as far as I've ever read mm -hmm. and deep competitiveness. Like it's a very, very competitive field. And I'm curious if you have observations about like what makes that successful, like even for yourself, like how, like, I'm sure you're competitive in whatever ways you're competitive. Like you don't get to where you are unless you have, you know, like you are a competitive tennis player. Like that's, you know, some things change, some things don't. Um, but I, I'm curious about that, like managing, mastering, enjoying that balance of competition and collaboration. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, academia is certainly not a perfect industry. Um, we have all sorts of problems, but uh, I do think collaboration is generally a huge strength of academia that it's, it's completely clear to me that you get farther, faster in teams in this world than uh, as a solo author. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty actually of academic manuscripts that are written alone it happens. Not that many empirical ones that end up having a real impact. And I will say I had to write one solo authored empirical paper to get my PhD. And the experience was truly miserable. I promised myself I would never do it again. You just gain so much more from bouncing ideas off of other people, having another perspective when you're struggling. The, the process of writing an academic paper is very long and arduous. You come up with an idea and in a burst of excitement, you, um, you try to figure out, you know, is this good? How do I design a study to test it? To me, not the, the next step is immediately asking other people, do you think this is interesting too? Do you think this would advance theory? Do you buy what I have to say before you go invest tons of time in collecting the data and spending years of your life um, pursuing this question? So other people are critical just for figuring out, should I even start this project? And then as you're designing how you'll test it, you know, getting improvements and refinements. If you do that alone, again, you miss out on all these other perspectives. Well, have you thought about it this way? Have you thought about it that way? And then there's this arduous publication process. After you collect the data, you think you have the perfect um, theory and model and you even validated it with, with the data you collected. Wow, like this is the dream. And by the way, the dream often doesn't come together. And then you need the social support to deal with picking up the pieces and deciding, okay, we have to abandon this bad idea and quit. That's hard too. Uh, but then you have to get through a publication process that involves rounds and rounds normally of rejection. Like the first thing that happens when you send a paper to a journal almost certainly is the first place says, no, we hate it. And you get re scathing reviews from three peers who are anonymized. So like just black box names with here are all the ways in which this is stupid. Here are all the things you didn't think about. Those other people are a support structure to help you say like, no, this really is good work, even if those three people hated it. Uh, and to pick up again and say, okay, how can we make it stronger? How can the next place we submit it, see it differently? How can we restructure our arguments? So I, I can't imagine going through it without a group of, I, mean, I, I can't, I did it once, it was awful. Um, but the other people, they make, they build your confidence, they build your competence and they make and it you, fun. <laughs> do you ever feel the threat of like, oh, here's someone else that like, the, or, or the competition with the people that you collaborate with? Do you feel that or you don't feel that? Not with the people I collaborate with because we're so clearly aligned on this with the same objective. Um, there's certainly competition in academia in terms of, you know, you're afraid someone else will scoop you. Uh, right. Oh no, is my brilliant idea that I think is so novel, somebody else possibly working on it. That, that's right. the worst kind of competition is. And, and it's silly because really ultimately what we should You're all trying about, to solve the same problems. Or it's it, like, great, we have more thinking about it. Right. Yeah. right. But, and, but I understand that human nature element yes, of it. Exactly. And I try to dampen that and, and remind myself as often as possible, like, it's great if multiple people are working on the same thing, we'll get to a better answer and try to find ways to reframe that. But Right. Um, but collaborators, I don't find really often turn into competitors. It's normally, it's normally someone else working on the same problem at the same time in some other place that, that right. makes you nervous and feel competition. Um, okay. So here's what I would love to do. I would love to, um, you know, rather, I was sort of thinking we could do this one of two ways, but rather than just go through each of those things, 
I'm going to have you, if you're open to it, coach me on a couple of changes that I want to make. And then let's point out like where we might be hitting into those problems. And we'll sort of take a walk through your book in that way. And, and anyone who's listening to this, buy her book. It's a great book, the How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. It just occurred to me, I didn't actually introduce you with the name of the book. I can't believe I didn't do that. I never don't do that. Um, we'll, we'll have it posted all over, but it's we're, you know we're speaking with Katie Milkman, her book, How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Um, so you have all these problems that you identify. I love how you organize the book, the getting started problem, the impulsivity problem, the procrastination problem, the forgetting problem, the laziness problem, the confidence problem, and the conformity problem. And these are problems that get in the way of our ability to change and what the research shows about how to deal with it. So I thought I would sort of, you know, I sort of wrote down here a couple of changes that I would like to make. One, which I'm generally sort of okay making, but but I I don't do very well with, and the other which is I'm terrible at, and you know I've tried a million different things in order to change it. Um, uh, so the the one that I'm generally okay at, but I really need to get better at, is to focus on my highest leverage activities. Like let's say what I really need to do is to connect with people. Like what I need to do is spend an hour a day or two hours a day making phone calls and connecting with people. Uh, and instead I get caught up with email or the, you know, like I, today I'm like, I've got a day full of interviews, both my being interviewed for my new book and, and interviewing other people. And so I'm not, I'm not prioritizing that somehow. And that's my most important thing that I do. And then, uh, you know, uh, also working with my current clients and things like that, but it's, there's a lot of things that I do that I consider to be important, but this is one that I highlight that I, that I fail to do to my satisfaction. And the other is um, either like to stop eating sugar completely, which is really what I need to do. Like, I don't mean, you know, oranges and berries. I mean, like cookies, cake, ice cream, et cetera. I'm much happier when I'm not eating sugar. And it is very, very hard for me to sustain that. But I, but you know, it is healthier for me and I feel better. Um, correlated that is to stop eating when I'm actually full as opposed to overfull. But I, I think the sugar one might be something that I've tried to tackle for years and, and don't tackle very well. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand myself over to you, doctor, and, and let's use the methodology in how to change uh, to kind of see if we could address some of these. Okay. That sounds great. Well, on the first one, you already told me a little bit about the obstacle you're facing. It sounds like life is busy and gets in the way of your higher level goal. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a priority, but you're not making time for it. Is that an accurate? Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think yes. And I think there's layers of that though. Like I love it when I do it the first 10 minutes, and maybe this goes to the getting started problem, but you know, when you first pick up a phone and you say, Hey, just want to check in, how are you doing? Like until the conversation gets in a flow it's a little awkward. Why are you calling? Why are you reaching out? Do they want you to reach out? Do they not want you to reach? Like there's that awkwardness. And once you get into it, it I'm fun. I'm having a fun conversation and I'm enjoying it and I'm learning things and I'm reconnected. Uh, so okay. it's- But you dread that start. Well, and also the, um, the outcomes are more amorphous. Like if I know I have an article to write, I know I have an article to write. I got to get it in. I got a deadline. I got to, if I know I have a client scheduled for, I, I've got to get to that client. I've got to meet with them. These it's like for the sake of what, for being connected, it will certainly grow my business. It's useful, but the there's, there's less of a direct line from I'm doing this activity and this is the outcome or result that I will get from it. All right. It sounds like you're calling it procrastination to me, actually. So um, it's something that you know is important, but the return is long run and you sort of dread the moment of initiation. And so you put it off and you put it off. So if that's the case, okay, the great. best solution science has to offer for procrastination is a commitment device. So commitment devices are these tools we use where we put constraints or rules on ourselves, which is super counterintuitive. We're really used to having them imposed on us by others to prevent us from giving into temptations like the temptation to procrastinate. So like we're used to, you know, speed limits and knowing we might get a speeding ticket uh, if we go too fast and we understand why that exists. But it's really weird to think of basically fining yourself, but it turns out doing that, it's really effective. So um, 
give you a specific example of a research study, and then we can think about how to apply it to you. One research study looked at people who were putting off quitting smoking. They meant to do it. They wanted to do it. They were smokers. That their intention was to quit, but they kept putting it off and um, randomly assigned them to two different experimental groups. One group got all the traditional sort of anti-smoking tools. Here's how you can quit. The other group got all those tools plus a commitment device where they could put money on the line that they would have to forfeit if they failed a nicotine or cotinine test in their urine six months in the future. But you know, if they pass that test, they get all the money that they put in this account back. It turns out the group that had that money. Um, so what's interesting, let me just point out, what's interesting yeah. about that is it's, it's, it's also play, it's not just playing to, you know, the hope of a gain, but it's the loss aversion. Like this is my money. I'm going to be getting it, but I'm going to lose it. And loss aversion is a lot stronger than, than, than the gain. That's right. It's not a reward. It also, no one else right. is spending a penny to motivate you. You're motivating yourself. You're motivating yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah it's an, right. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. So, Sorry. No, no problem. So the group that had access to this commitment device that could put money on the line, they quit smoking at a 30% higher rate over the next six months. So really effective tool. And it's been proven that these kinds of constraints can be useful for problems ranging from helping people save more to um, helping them buy healthier groceries to even helping students do better in school. So I would say if you could tolerate it, trying to create a commitment device for a, you know, defining a specific number of these calls you want to make either daily or weekly, because it's really important that your commitment be to something bite sized and like, you know, achievable in a reasonable time frame. You don't want to say like, oh, I'll, I'll make this many calls in a month, and then on the last day of the month, you know, you're going to be out a thousand dollars if you don't make a really large number of phone right. calls. That's, you know, you don't want to back up on on a deadline like that. So right. if it's maybe daily and a small fine that you impose on yourself and have somebody who can hold you accountable and act as a referee, and you can mm -hmm. use one of these websites like stick.com or Beeminder where they will be the middle person and, and take the money and send it perhaps to a charity you hate to make sure there's no silver lining if right. you have to give that money away. Um, they have charities on either side of hot button issues, which I think is really clever. So you yeah, can it's pick clever. your poison. Yeah, so um, that would be my first recommendation because that just basically increases the price of your vice. And if the right. issue is it's a delayed um, penalty for not engaging, you bring that penalty forward and make that price something you feel much faster and right. more sharply. I'm curious about two things. One is, um, have you done research or looked at research at, you know, we're talking about happiness when succeeding with changes, at the impact of losing in that game? Meaning, you know, like now, not only have you like not made those calls, but you've also given money to a charity that you really hate. And what that does to both your like, both happiness levels and confidence levels and things like that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I haven't personally, and I don't know of research on that. The research that I've seen only looks at how huge the upside is of just giving people access to this overall. But right. of course, the individuals who still stumble are not facing <laughs> a double whammy, right? right. The idea like is hitting someone set, when they're down. Yeah, yeah. So you want to set these price tags high enough that that failure is something you're just not going to tolerate. Feels like it's right? not an option. Yeah, that's um, right. And of course there's um, there's sort of side hatches for if there's like a real disaster, right? Like you end up in the hospital and you can't make your calls. Right, right, right. You can be right. let out of these contracts. Um, what do you, uh, what other commitment devices exist? Because I've, I've heard a lot about kind of giving monies to charities you don't like. I, I worry a little bit that this tactic that, that you know, we all, suggest ends up giving a tremendous amount of money to charities that we all hate but it's but true. uh <laughs> it's true um, there is apparently a wing in a presidential library who which one i won't name that um it was entirely funded by these kinds funded of by a, by a failed commitment <laughs> yeah yeah um, not one an accumulation but anyway that's yes funny. it's true um uh, I'm curious about what other devices there are in that commitment strategy you know besides money yeah, so money is what I like to call a hard commitment device in that, uh, you know, the penalty is really clear and painful. Right. And another kind of commitment device that can be useful, though tends to be less effective, is a soft commitment device where there's going to be some penalty that's not quite as as pinchy or as precise, like maybe more of a psychological cost. And there you can do simple things like making pledges publicly, um, you know, letting other people track your performance, right? If you have a social media account, you can post 
uh, I plan to do this today and then later tell everyone, oops, I fell down on my face. Right. So, so public shame. shaming kind of. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> public shaming, exactly, um, being held accountable. There, there's still value in sort of defining clearly what your goal is, making a plan, which are the kinds of things you would probably do as a part of a commitment device, right? right. In order to decide you're going to have a commitment device, you have to say like, well, to what? Exactly right. what is it that I'm going to penalize? And that itself you know, if it's twice a day, I have to make these calls by 5 p.m. or else I'm in trouble. Actually, the right. act of articulating that and laying that out there and saying, you know, when am I going to do it? Where am I going to do it? There's research showing that increases the likelihood you'll follow through. Right. It reduces forgetting. It uh, it creates cognitive dissonance, which is this term for like the discomfort you feel when you say one thing and do another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that alone is going to be helpful. And then again, if you can add some element of shame or accountability to other people, that may help more as well. So right. you can do those things and they right. should help. They're just not going to be as powerful as something that, that has right. extra. extra um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this question. I'm just curious about whether there's research on this too. It's sort of a little bit of a flip side of the question that I just asked, which is the cost of you know, like I, I do a lot of these things and I think there is a cost of pressure that I put on, like I'm, I'm a kind of a type A person. And so like I'm putting all these structures and rules and borders around myself in order to keep myself driven and focused and moving. And I wonder if there's any research on the cost of that. Like there's some human cost to, um, to, to sort of, motivating ourselves in these kinds of very structured ways. Uh, and I'm curious if you know of research around that, or if you have a quick thought on it. Yeah, my instinct is, it's funny, it's the opposite, is that generally these kinds of structures and constraints make life easier because um, they simplify the decision process. And there's um, great research by uh, um, Peter Goldwitzer of New York University, who's done a lot of the work on the importance of sort of making a concrete plan and, and laying that all out. He writes about the idea that um, sort of like, it is a lot like sort of crossing the Rubicon when you make these plans because of the cognitive dissonance that you put into place. And it simplifies your choices in a sense because you've set things up for yourself uh, in a way with all these structures that you don't have to you don't have to look back. There is nothing to right. look back right. at. Right. There's no decision. You're simplifying your decision making. Yeah. So, so I actually, I have the opposite, based on the research that I know, I have the opposite impression of, uh, of how these structures work. I think they make right. life easier. We have to do less deliberation. We can operate in a simpler. Um, we're reducing sphere. uncertainty in a sense, right? Yeah, we're reducing right. uncertainty and angst and, um, right. and increasing performance. So I, right. I don't see the downside so much, but you know, I'm sure there's some, right. I'm sure we could find examples where it does exist, but on, on average, I think the structures and constraints make life easier. All right, Katie, solve my sugar problem and I will be indebted to you forever. Yeah. The sugar problem is a tough one. Of course you could use commitment devices there too. Cause this is also a, a problem of, right. It's, it's not exactly it's not quite procrastination. procrastination. It's just present bias more generally, which is like, yeah. it's not what, what I've, to do the thing that's good for you in the long yeah, run. Yeah. And what I've realized, you know, like I'm very good at doing things. I'm not so good at not doing things, right? Like there's these yeah. two categories of change. Like one is positive and one is preventative in a sense, like not. And, and what I realized is when I was reading your book and talking about temptation bundling is I temptation bundle ice cream with watching movies. And it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like two vices put together and I'm just sitting there very happy eating ice cream, binging on Netflix going, this isn't really working, but I always do the two together. So you so will appreciate is, that my five-year-old um, only gets to watch TV while he's eating his green vegetables. So we do it differently in my house. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're much smarter with your five-year-old. I have this fantasy that he's going to go to like Super Bowl parties in his twenties and bring the Brussels sprouts, but Brussels sprouts. We'll right. That's that. good. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. We'll or that like fantasy. I, pans out or like or, a guy who was never allowed to eat any sugar as a kid <laughs> or watch tv as a kid he's going to be binging on ice cream watching you know at the super bowl that's right it could the totally be that wasn't we'll allowed see. to do as a kid i i tend to do more of than is I, good I haven't constrained him from doing those things too he just has to eat his vegetables first um, right. 
Okay, so I guess, so present bias, you could think about using commitment devices for this problem too. But the other thing that feels relevant to me here is the path of least resistance and habits and um, defaults. And so I wonder if the path of least resistance in your life is the one that leads you to sugar, or if you could set up some uh, changes that would make it easier for you to choose other meal options or other kinds of snacks. So defaults are these really powerful tools uh, that are often thought about like, you know, whatever default browser comes with your computer, you're much more likely to use because one click and you're done. You don't think about it. You just take whatever's there, you know. Right. You tend to be an organ donor if you have to uncheck organ donor as opposed to check organ donor. Exactly. Whatever whatever is um, happening naturally, you just go with that flow. So I wonder if you could actually in a moment of, you know, desire to change, change the structures and change the defaults in your life by doing things like, you know, making sure that your house doesn't have these things available and it does have other attractive snacks uh, mm -hmm. in the pantry so that when you get up, if I don't know if you're working from home right now, like, like I am, um, maybe you're back in the office, you could do the same thing in your office. But either way, when you get up and you're going out looking for a snack because you need something or you're looking for a tasty treat to eat while you're watching Netflix, what's available are like yogurt bars as opposed to right. you know, cake. Um, so the challenge with that pantry. For me, the challenge with that is, first of all, I, you know, I have a family, I have three kids, I have like, you know, other people like ice cream too, and they don't have an issue with the way I do. But also what I found is, my, yeah, like if I'm in a very isolated uh, uh, sort of static environment, I could pull that off. Yeah. But I travel, I have dinner with clients, I have dinners with friends, I, like there's always access to it. Yeah, uh, and you can't it, set up you know, defaults it's a little hard to, to, you know, the default is, do you want the dessert menu? Like that's the default, you know, the default is, oh, we're all hanging out, we're relaxing, you have a little wine, you have some nice food, let's go, let's have dessert. Like, so, so the, the, the social and cultural defaults defy what my personal default should or would be, which is not to eat ice cream. How do I manage that? Yeah, it's really, really tough. I think that, you know, commitment devices are a really good option again in this case, because then you're increasing the price of the device, right? The dessert doesn't just cost you, I don't know what kind, you know, what restaurant you're going to and what it costs, let's say less than $20 at almost any restaurant. Uh, and so now you could increase the price of your device and say, you know, if I get dessert, I'm fined and this money goes, let's send a large right. amount of money to an organization I don't like. So, so I do think I feel a little boring going to the same tool because there are so many, but it seems like you need the same kind same of thing. structure for this particular problem is just increase the price of the thing that's awful. And I guess the other answer is habit. If you can think about ways to really deliberately build habits um, so that you won't be tempted as much by that dessert, or you'll maybe you build a habit of always having berries after dinner. That's the way you satisfy your sweet right. tooth you look right. forward to it um if you you could do that and you know enough frequently enough and build enough of a habit and, and satisfaction with that achieving i that wonder goal, if you, you may be able to go to that substitute. if you i don't know if you've you've discovered you know you've seen this and if you've done this research in this particular kind of way but i wonder if people like i just gave you two what feels like very different problems and we have we have similar solutions for both and i wonder whether people like whether you can profile people to some degree to go this is these are the kinds of changes or these are the kinds of struggles that you have like i i look at i look at your list and i think well that sugar thing is there's a conformity problem there's a confidence problem i don't know so much about the laziness problem but you know certainly an impulsivity problem like like uh, this is like what makes these hard for me is it's, it's a confluence of a number of different kinds of challenges that all come together that make this one particularly hard for me. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. And, I mean, I don't know if you think that coaching other people who are trying to solve this one could help you. You mentioned confidence, but that's often a really valuable tool is sort of an advice club of other people who all also want to cut out sugar that you just connect with and like share tips. 
uh, you get some social support and you could also be put in the position of advice giver and might give you some ideas to have to come up with insights for other people. It's a little bit of a funny one to have a, an advice club around. It's not like a huge life goal in the way you might normally think of career advancement. But if it's important to you, it's probably important to some other people in your life. And even if they're not in your home and you could think about just sharing, sharing suggestions on a regular basis. Yeah, you know what, I, as I think about it, it, it fits into the category of sort of a, a, a lightly spoken addiction, you know, like the thing, it's like the, the I do email, I, I do my email, or I'm doing Facebook, I mean, I don't, social media is not, not a vice of mine. Uh, some people might not consider it a vice, some people might consider it a virtue, but for me, like, it's just not that interesting for me to, to spend a lot of time on social media. Um, but it, it fits into that category of like, somewhat compulsive behaviors that we have a hard time stopping. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and anything that involves addiction, I should also say, I do think there's other tools outside of sort of the behavioral science toolkit that can be particularly important. Like some, you can get therapy, um, sometimes, you know, going to treatment centers is important. And those are sort of outside the scope of what I write and think about, right. which really isn't right. related to addiction but other kinds of change where there's no chemical dependencies involved. Um, right. I, don't, I don't know if sugar would be considered an addiction, but, but right. you could think about looking at, at the, those um, research literatures too and seeing if there's something yeah, for yeah. you. Yeah. But I, uh, I don't think there are sort of, so two things that you said that I just wanna double click on. One is, uh, yes, it's absolutely the case that there are often a confluence of barriers to a given change you wanna make and that using multiple tools from science to help get to your end goal is a, a great strategy as opposed to just sort of picking one. The other thing that I think is worth noting is um, every problem in your, we, you just chose two that had a lot of similarities but actually it's more often than not the case that um, within an individual's life, there are different problems they're facing to make different changes happen. So there's a lot of heterogeneity to use a nerd term like variety and the barriers we face as opposed to homogeneity or homogeneity. similarity. Mm -hmm. um, you happen to give me two similar examples where the, the barrier to change was really procrastination, present bias. It's not fun in the moment. There's this delayed reward. I do right. think that might be the mother of all problems, right? Like yeah, if I had to yeah, pick yeah, one, yeah. and a lot of my work has looked at that, but, right. um, but it's not the case that all your problems will look that way. And that's part of why it's important to know about right. other tactics for building confidence, overcoming, forgetting, et cetera. You know, one of the reasons why I think your, your book, How to Change is uh, so sort of important and timely. And when I say timely, I don't mean like, you know, September, 2021, but, but I mean, we're, we're living in a world that is, that is increasingly and very, very skillfully using behavioral economics to drive our behaviors in ways that we don't feel good about, right. That, that like serve, purposes that are not our best interests, you know, and everything from, you know, manufacturing the Dorito so you don't stop eating it to, you know, to, um, uh, you know, social media that keeps you scrolling or, and, and so it's like the natural boundaries that we used to have, even going to the office and then coming home, like we've got all of these devices that enable us to do anything at any time, you know, all hours of the night. And so, and they're tempting and they're fun. And so we're sort of, you know, like what's, what's interesting is you, your, your book and, and this, this element of behavioral economics, which is about, you know, like how do we shape our behaviors in ways that support our happiness and our aspirations it's really coming at a time when there are so many um, uh, tactics that are being used to serve purposes other than our own. And, and it becomes very, very important to like, I think, understand that structure and then say, okay, how do I manage myself in, in you know, the conformity problem? How do I manage myself when the, the slide into behaviors I don't, that don't make me happy is so easy and facilitated, you know, by every part of my environment. 
Yeah, it's a it's a depressing point, <laughs> but I think I I agree with you that um, you know, the more the more marketers know about us, uh, the more you know, the more things are combined into conglomerates and and organizations have tons of data and resources to optimize, the harder it is for us to resist temptations that they throw at us. So, uh, having more tools at our disposal is probably more important now than ever in order to make change that we want to make as opposed to the change that was thrust upon us. We have been speaking with Katie Milkman. Her new book out is How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Katie, it has been a total pleasure. I will, uh, I'll let you know how my, I mean, I'll let you know whether the, the charities I dislike are getting my money. Um, and I really appreciate you being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Go stop.